Welcome to Process Control Design and Practice. My name is Tom Meadowcroft. In this video, we will learn about functional specifications. As engineers, we like to think of ourselves as people who build things, but do we really? Welders, pipe fitters, electricians, insulators physically build things. Programmers configure control systems. We also like to talk about the processes we run, but really the processes are run by operators working with an automated control system. So no, we don't build or run anything, and yet we do get to decide how others will build and run our processes because they rely on us to tell them how to do it. Your ability to perform your job as an engineer, to guide how things are built and run, is as much a function of how well you can communicate your ideas to others as it is a function of the quality of those ideas. A functional specification is a description and definition of a process for control system professionals, people who need to understand how a process works at the level of its automation. To a lesser extent, it is also for operators, technicians, managers, and other engineers who may use it as a reference. It is functional because it describes in detail how the process and its automation will work, and it is a good specification if it is clear, concise, correct, and complete. A good functional specification will reduce project costs because it will lead to less confusion and fewer errors by those who build the software and hardware for the control system and will lead to a faster, safer startup and commissioning. The control system gets implemented last when building a project and must work first for the startup to proceed. Most projects struggle with flaws in the control system during startup. It's a huge factor in project timing and success. The necessary elements of a functional specification are the elements that you have learned if you have viewed the lessons, read the text, and completed the exercises throughout this course. There will be P&IDs, lists of input-output devices, feedback controllers and their design, discrete logic, sequences for batch recipes and phases or continuous production modes, and specifications for operator interface. It is generally best to divide a functional spec into units for batch processes and single processes running from raw material to product storage tanks for continuous processes. Each batch unit or continuous process functional spec should be self-contained with standard included elements. The piping and instrumentation diagrams for a project are the picture that speaks a thousand words. They must be correct and consistent with the rest of the specification. Use a sensible tag naming scheme. Every device must have a tag name. Clearly show which devices communicate to the control system. Clearly indicate with multiple tags where there is feedback from devices like limit switches on valves and run indication on motors. Show the simple feedback controls and interlocks with dotted lines, although this information will also be specified in more detail in the text. When cataloging all of the I.O. devices in a batch unit or a continuous process, subdivide the I.O. in a batch unit module into equipment modules following the S88 standard by function. Remember that each equipment module will have one or more phases that do a useful task. Break a continuous process into one module per unit operation. So if you have a continuous reactor followed by two distillation columns, for instance, divide the IO into those three modules. This will be useful as each module in a continuous process will likely have an independent state or production mode for the purposes of startup and shutdown. Make tables of I.O. devices according to the type of I.O. For analog inputs, you'll want a catalog P&ID number, equipment module, tag name, description, range in units, and the four standard alarms, high, 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 low, and low, low. If a device doesn't have alarms or just some of them, leave the rest blank. The instrument range and units are essential to allow scaling of the inputs into useful real number variables in the controller. For analog outputs, mostly control valves and motor speeds, 
we need the same identifying information. In addition, the fail or passive position, open or closed, is essential to specify for valves, as a fail closed valve has to be sent a 20 milliamp signal to open fully, while a fail open valve will be sent a 4 milliamp signal to achieve the same position. For every valve, indicate whether there is feedback on the position of that valve with the tag name for the analog input for that feedback. For variable speed motors, the analog output is generally labeled SC for speed control and the feedback ST for speed transmitter. Note that those feedback signals for the analog output devices are in fact analog inputs. Listing them both as analog inputs and also here in the output table is thorough and best practice. Digital outputs are mostly commands to block valves and motors. Fail position is again essential together with specification of digital limit switch feedback for open or closed. If you have analog feedback on your digital valve, the column label will change. Some functional specifications choose to group valves and pumps in separate tables. Digital inputs will include limit switches on valves, but also level switches, flow switches, and rupture disc burst indicators. Note the new columns here defining the meaning of true. Most digital input devices should be wired so that the normal or safe state is powered or true. This is so that if the device or its wiring fails, the system will see the abnormal state and alarm, signaling the system and the operator to find the problem and fix it. So the input signal for T301's level switch will be normally true and false for a high level. This does not mean the tag name LSHHT301 need be true when the level is normal. By specifying input true and tag output true differently, that tells the programmer to invert the signal from the I.O. card when defining LSHHT301. Feedback controllers combine an analog input for the process variable input, an analog output for the manipulated variable output, and a controller which has its own tag name. If the controller is a subordinate controller receiving a remote set point in a cascade arrangement, identify that here. Finally, you must specify the action of the controller. To define action, we need to define the error, which is the process variable minus the set point target. The action is defined as the direction that we wish to move the output relative to the loop error. If positive error requires a positive output change in reaction, the action is direct. If the required output move to a positive error is negative, the action is reverse. For example, if we have a flow controller with a control valve and the measured flow is above the set point, the error is positive. We would want the valve to close or move negatively to make the flow approach its set point. That makes this a reverse acting controller. I personally find this confusing because if the input and output of the controller move in the same direction, that's reverse acting. And if they move in opposite directions, that's direct action. But I didn't create the standard Simple flow controllers and heaters are reverse acting and level control using a tank outlet flow as your degree of freedom and coolers are direct acting. Think carefully when completing this specification, it's easy to get it wrong. If you have special continuous controls like minimum or maximum selectors for a continuous constraint controller or calculations to be carried out continuously, Describe them clearly in the section devoted to feedback controllers using a table, a drawing, or just text. If it is something unusual, try writing out a function block diagram in the specification because that's the best way to make clear to the programmer what she needs to do as function block diagrams are how most continuous controls are going to be implemented on the control system. For sequences, both recipes and phases, I taught you how to use sequential function charts. This is always the clearest means of communicating sequential logic. 
For each sequence, list any input or output parameters in an accompanying table. Give description and engineering units for every parameter. Most units will have many interlocks and other forms of discrete logic. Do not rely on what is pictured on the PNID or on a paragraph description. Discrete logic is best structured in a three column table. The first column is the logical expression. The second column is the action that results if the logical expression is true. The third column is the delay, if any. Use this structure to force yourself to express the logic clearly. This is exactly the form the programmer will need to configure your logic, as he or she will probably be using relay ladder logic. If you want, add a fourth column with a text description. Graphical user interfaces are the graphic screens that will paint a picture of the process in your control room and allow operator interaction with the automated process. Creating good graphics is critical to the future performance of the process and in particular to keeping the operators happy. Use your favorite drafting or drawing software to sketch out the picture you want and the locations where you want tag name data displayed, including units for each graphic screen. Work with the operators when writing the specification to be sure you are specifying what they need and want to operate well. Expect that revisions will be needed. People have strong opinions on graphic screens. Like all specifications, a functional specification should have a section for contractors and visiting internal specialists that spells out the rules for configuring control systems in your company and on your site. These rules should not change from project to project have a firm set of rules for tag names and other variable names and numbering inside the control system. Insist that continuous controls are configured using function block diagrams and that sequences are configured using sequential function charts. Because if you don't, programmers will use their own favorite shortcuts and hand you a system which is hard to read and maintain. Once you have your rules, make sure they are followed. A functional specification is a design document, but is also the technical basis for your contract with the contractor. Look for a full text, exercises, and more videos at chemicalengineeringpractice.org. I'm Tom Meadowcroft. I hope to see you again soon.